Um, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I work with uh, San Maria Valley Physical Therapy quite a bit, so thank you for hosting this as well. And I know John was telling me some of you are from all over. It's far down in Simi Valley, so that's quite a trip to come to this meeting tonight. So thank you for that. So um, hip arthroscopy is one of the things I um, was trained in in fellowship. And at that time, um, we weren't doing a lot of repairs and uh, just basically doing debridements in the hip. Uh, it's come a long way uh, in the last eight or ten years. And so I figured at first I'd just present some of the cases that are kind of common to my practice now. Some of the most common things you guys will see when you see hip arthroscopy patients. Kind of see what we do in surgery, see what we're seeing so that when you're doing the rehab for those patients it makes a little more sense. Um, and then I'll give a second little talk about uh, just rehab and kind of the basics, at least from our point of view, from the surgeon point of view, of what's important about rehab. Maybe not all the nitty gritty details you guys might want, but just uh, kind of some of the big basics and bullet points for rehab for these patients. So uh, I'll show you guys a few of my um, cases. Uh, this uh, he already went over, just some of <laughs> what I do, but a big part of my practice is focused on arthroscopy and, um, and, and hip injuries and uh, hip arthroscopy. Um, so some of the common patients are young uh, male patients with uh, femoral acetabular impingement. You see more and more of this as being diagnosed more and more frequently with or without a labral tear. And then female patients with uh, mixed FAI, CAM, or pincer lesions um, and labral injuries as well. Um, some of our middle-aged patients that have some of these early degenerative findings, maybe some CAM impingement, uh, labral tears, articular cartilage damage, it starts to become more common. Um, and then maybe some of our older patients that we see with uh, trochanteric bursitis. Um, you know, this is kind of a wastebasket term. We hear about people having bursitis in their hip all the time. There's a lot of pathology underlying that, tendon injuries and so forth. So I'll show one of those cases. And then some traumatic hip injuries. We'll see people with dislocations. We'll see people that fell off of something. I just saw a guy from the base that um, was doing some kind of active shooter drill. Someone tackled him and he dislocated his hip. Because he had cam impingement, he actually levered his hip right out of the joint just from twisting it wrong. Um, so just basically a quick overview of impingement. Uh, this is a mismatch between the femoral head and socket. So just like this picture here, you know, when they come up into flexion, internal rotation, they're not fitting symmetrically, and it causes impingement. Um, this causes damage to cartilage and the, the chondrolabral junction and the labrum. Um, these usually present as kind of deep groin pain not buttock pain, not lateral-based hip pain. And this is being more and more recognized as a precursor to arthritis. So you see people having this before they develop hip arthritis. Uh, early treatment helps prevent further problems. And minimally invasive surgery, arthroscopy, is kind of what we're seeing now as being used to treat these problems <laughs> rather than big open surgical hip dislocations. Um, so first patient, this one's from a couple weeks ago. This is a Cal Poly linebacker. He's 21. Um, he had groin pain for six months. He possibly had a hip flexor strain, and that's a common scenario. Uh, people, di they get diagnosed with a hip flexor problem. Hip strain just doesn't go away. Um, so then people start to look deeper. He presented with a, a kind of classic C sign. People come in complaining that they have pain like this in their groin deep or even radiating through to the back, and we just call that the C sign. It makes sense. So that's pretty common for patients with problems in the joint. Um, he had difficulty planting, pivoting, running, so any explosive movements he was having difficulty participating at the level he needed to. He tried the typical treatments, the rest, therapy, uh, anti-inflammatories, didn't get better. So on his exam, uh, his hip flexion wasn't too bad, just a little bit <coughs> limited on that side. Internal rotation was terrible, zero uh, for a 21-year-old guy, and only 10 degrees on his non-painful uh, side, which is also pretty bad. Uh, external rotation, relatively equal, abduction, uh, not too great, but and decreased. Um, no proximal adductor pain, no athletic pubalgia symptoms. Um, he did have a positive impingement test, which is pretty classic for these patients. And then uh, no tenderness or problems over his greater trochanter. So here's his supine just laying there on the table x-ray of both of his hips. And we're talking about the one that's on your left, which is his right hip. And if you draw a circle around his femoral head, you can see there are some areas that lie outside of the circle. That's when you get impingement. So inflection, internal rotation, that area of bone is trying to fit its way into his hip joint. Um, on this special lateral view, 
Same thing, if you look at the air, you can see it even better. So he's got a pretty big, this, is a large, this would be classified as a pretty large cam lesion in his hip causing damage. Um, MRI is not showing up very well there, but again, on the MRI in certain views, you can see how big these uh, impingement lesions are. This is a picture of the labral tear on the other side, which doesn't project very well. Uh, here's an arthroscopic picture. So we put the camera in, hips distracted, you know, less than a centimeter there, just so we can see in. And you can see the labrum there in the chondrolabral junction is pretty torn up in his hip. This is a 21-year-old kid. Uh, this is a picture of his labrum reattached. You can see he had a full thickness cartilage lesion there. The yellow area is actually bone that's exposed. Um, that was delaminated off, uh, you know, off the bone at the edge of the acetabulum. This, these are fluoroscopic pictures taken intraoperatively before and after we do the osteoplasty for the impingement lesion for the cam lesion. So you can see on the left here, uh, that everything outside the circle on the top there should not be there. And then after the osteoplasty on the right, it uh, looks much better. And his range of motion improved intraoperatively after you do this, the range of motion is already better. And these are just different views in rotation looking at uh, this impingement lesion he had. So he, he had a nice resection of that and repair of his labrum. Um, next case, 21-year-old uh, female. This is a female who slipped and fell. Um, a year ago, it had the same thing, positive C sign, pain just would not go away. Um, intermittent sharp pain and popping. Um, this was again treated conservatively with no improvement. Her range of motion, her hip, hip flexion was pretty equal. Internal rotation wasn't too limited. External rotation is pretty equal. Um, abduction looked fine. Uh, again, no athletic pubalgia, no proximal adductor pain. Again, she had a positive impingement sign and nothing around the greater trochanter. This doesn't project too well, but you can see on her left hip, which is on our right, um, the overhang or the over coverage of her acetabulum. She's got a pretty big, what we call pincer lesion. So same thing, impingement, but it's coming from the other side of the joint. Uh, here's another view of that. You can see it's pretty impressive how much uh, acetabulum is over, over coverage she has on her hip there. So again, she had a labral tear as well as seen on the MRI. And the MRI picture on the left, you can see how much coverage there is over the femoral head. It's ab abnormally uh, excessive there. Here is an arthroscopic picture. The bone's projecting out towards us, and this is a big shelf projecting out towards us, uh, causing impingement, pincer type impingement. And that's after that's been shaved back, and then those are anchors going in there to repair the labrum back to the bone. Um, doesn't, this doesn't project very well either, but this is after we take the traction off and the labral repair, and we've recreated a nice suction seal for her in her hip. Uh, again, arthroscopic pictures, you can see a burr in the bottom left picture burring off that little ridge, and then the final picture on the right. Uh, next patient, 58-year-old uh, female. We all see a lot of these patients that come in that have had bursitis. They've been diagnosed that I have bursitis. They come in to see me and they've had, you know, five or six cortisone injections. They all work for a little while and they wear off and they have other problems. Either people stop coming in because they just get sick of complaining about it and learn to live with it, or they get better. Some people don't. Um, so on, you know, her history, this has been going on 18 months. She failed, you know, all conservative treatment, including multiple injections. Can't sleep on the side. That's kind of a classic finding. And uh, she was having a significant limp, which is more classic for this type of problem. Um, her hip motion was symmetric, so different than an impingement patient. She had good range of motion, uh, no anterior impingement. She did walk with a Trendelenburg gait, so that's something you'll see in a, in a, if they have a big tendon injury, and pretty tender over the greater trochanter weakness on Obertest. So her x-rays look good. So if you look at her hips, um, her hips look like they're supposed to. She's older than these other patients, but her hips look normal on x-ray. And here is that lateral view where if you do a circle around that one, it looks perfectly normal and she's got a pretty good joint space. Um, so MRI of her hip here, where the tendon comes down and attaches, there's quite a bit of swelling there and it doesn't actually attach to the bone. The tendon's black in that image and there's no, it, it's just not attaching where it's supposed to. So she has a tear of the gluteus medius tendon at the greater trochanter. Um, here's an arthroscopic picture of that. Um, just below the sub-Q tissue, you put the camera in, and you can see the IT band. So in order to get down to where we need to work, we split the IT band. This is a little arthroscopic bovi here. And so after we split that, the picture on the left, underneath are where the tendons attach to the trochanter. And on um, this picture on the right, if you just, they just sweep right aside. They're not even attached to the bone. 
And so to repair this, we just prepare the bone to a nice bleeding surface and put in some anchors. She got a couple of anchors in there and, and tie it back to where it belongs. Here's a picture afterwards. Uh, you can see the metallic anchors holding her tendon back down there. And she did well. She needed a cane for about three months still. She used a walker for six weeks, which is typical. Um, still needed a cane for up to three months, but six months later she did very well. Her hip, her Trendelenburg gait resolved. She got her strength back. She was pretty happy. Uh, last patient I'll show you guys here is a 27-year-old fell from a pretty good height, 15 or 20 feet off a ladder. He's putting up Christmas lights. This is a common uh, injury we'll see about that time of year. Um, he used a walker for a while. They got x-rays. Nothing major was broken. So he was just, you know, tried to rehab this and just never got better. He had uh, groin pain, pressure clicking, instability symptoms, couldn't get back to activity. Uh, his exam, poor range of motion all around, actually in both of his hips. His hip flexion, a little bit limited and bad on his left side too. Uh, rotation was zero and also bad on his left side, not as bad. External rotation, extremely limited. Uh, abduction limited, um, and then he had quite a positive impingement sign. So if you look at his x-ray, we're looking at uh, the left side of the picture here, the right hip. You can see that there's a bony fragment there off of his acetabulum, but the other thing you can see is he's got cam impingement too. His femoral head is not round. Um, and here's the lateral picture. You can see that piece of bone that's just hanging out there. It's like almost like having a rock in your shoe. He had this in his hip. And so when you bring his hip up into certain positions, it would pinch on that and it caused a lot of pain. Again, you can see his cam lesion in this picture. Uh, MRI showed the same findings in the right picture here. You can see he does have that impingement bump uh, in addition to this fracture he had. And so this is an arthroscopic picture. You can see the first, just looking in there, he had a big piece of bone stuck to the top of his labrum there. Uh, so we shelled that out and um, he had a cartilage injury. His cartilage is delaminating in this picture on the right here. This is the roof of the acetabulum. His cartilage is just being peeled off. And so we stabilized that, did a microfracture on that bare spot. And then he had this cam lesion. You can see on the left, the convex area is the cam lesion outside of the joint. And so that's been shaved down in the picture on the right. And then those are the pieces we pulled out of his hip that were not attached anymore, uh, several of them. And there's his picture afterwards. So we fixed the, yeah, yes. uh, so on his, his hip there, that piece, those pieces are gone about the outside of his acetabulum. And then also he fixed his cam lesion that he had, which was causing trouble as well and probably caused those fractures. Um, so follow up, uh, three months after surgery, limp, his limp and pain resolved. His hip motion improved significantly and actually is better now than his left hip which he probably also has cam impingement on. You'll see these patients and they come in and one hip hurts, you get an x-ray, they both look terrible, but only one of them is bothering, bothering the patient and we currently are not treating you know, asymptomatic hips prophylactically. So treat his right hip, his left hip range of motion is not great, but it doesn't hurt, so it's being left alone. He's back to work as a correctional officer. Um, so anyway, that's a uh, few cases uh, from this year. Um, just kind of give you guys an idea of what we're seeing inside the hip. So when you get these notes from us that say we did an osteoplasty and a labral pair, and maybe it'll make a little more sense. Um, and then we'll, the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about rehab. So we'll just segue right into this. This will kind of, it's all the same topic, but um, just to go over some rehab principles. Um, I gave John a copy of kind of one of the latest articles written by physical therapists about rehabbing hip arthroscopy patients, particularly impingement patients. And he has that, so if anyone wants that, I refer to it a little bit. It goes into more depth as far as all the different exercises at each phase of rehab. Um, and I think it's really it's good to read. It's uh, just a couple years old now, so um, pretty good information that's being used. Um, so bringing this up, the hip arthroscopy, uh, this has been classified recently as the most rapidly growing field in orthopedic surgery. So you may be seeing more of these patients in the last few years and even more in the future. Uh, the data I could find on this when preparing for this talk was it's increased 18 times as many arthroscopic hip surgeries in, the in 10 years. So dramatic growth in the number of these surgeries being performed. Commonly used to treat things we just saw, FAI, impingement, labral tears, loose bodies, abductor tendon tears, and snapping hip problems. Um, rehab protocols are developed. They've kind of the ones you'll find in the literature are mostly developed between physical therapists and surgeons that do high volume hip arthroscopy. Uh, and my disclaimer is I'm not a physical therapist, so don't grill me on the physical therapy stuff too much. Um, but I wanted to just present 
from you know the surgeon point of view and kind of the big broad strokes about which patients you need to look out for certain things on. Um, so just basics. Uh, this is an article I was referencing that John has uh, in its entirety, so we can print that out and uh, if anyone wants it there. Um, but from that article, just this is typical post-op rehab stuff, not just for hip scopes, but um, you know, you want to protect the integrity of the healing tissue, control pain inflammation, allow for early range of motion, reduce muscle inhibition problems, and uh, restore proprioception, normalize gait, improve strength. You could apply this to any lower extremity uh, patient that comes in probably. Um, and then part of these programs is they're individualized and evaluation based. So they're not really time based. You don't do this for four weeks and then they're definitely off crutches or it's, you know, there's not a lot of you know, hard timelines. It's more about kind of how the patient's doing it, if they meet the criteria to progress. So they're tailored to these findings at surgery. What did we do? Did we do a microfracture or something else? Um, specific procedure performed. They're not, all hip scopes are definitely not the same. The precautions are going to be a little different. Um, you know, individualize it for the patient. Uh, circumduction is being used more early on to prevent uh, scar tissue in and around the joint. And then sport-specific functional rehab should be included, and this will be in phase four of the rehab protocol that I'll go over with you guys. Um, so this four-phase uh, rehab program, that's uh, one thing I'll talk about briefly. Uh, Surgery-specific consideration, so what did we do and what, how does that change the rehab? And then how can our patients maintain their cardiovascular health when they're going through this prolonged rehab with hip scopes? Uh, you know, you put them on crutches for three or four weeks, maybe six weeks with a microfracture. How are we keeping these patients, you know, our active patients or our athletes, how are we keeping them happy and uh, in cardiovascular shape? Um, so the four-phase program, these are the four phases that are commonly described in the literature if you read about hip scope rehab. Phase one, you want to protect, uh, protect the joint and, and work on mobility, uh, stability in phase two, strengthening, and then return to sport. So there are objective criteria used to advance from one phase to the next, and, you know, this allows for all the differences you'll encounter in the patients. Um, Phase one, this maximum protection and mobility phase, uh, usually lasts four or six weeks and our more active patients that are in good shape going in, four weeks is pretty typical. Um, you wanna protect whatever we repaired. So that's where uh, you know, knowing what was done at the time of surgery is important. Uh, obviously you're diminishing pain and inflammation, restoring about, you know, most literature you see at 75% or 80% of the range of motion to go to the next phase and then prevent muscle inhibition problems. Um, so, uh, typical physical therapy stuff that you do early on with your early post-op patients. Uh, they can get on a non-resistant stationary bike right away. I tell my patients, you know, the next day after surgery, that's fine. 20 minutes once, twice a day on the ups, you know, on the outside. But most people will get on the bike for 10 minutes at first, uh, non-resistant at first. Um, so within, we'll talk about some range of motion restrictions, but we want to restore their mobility within that restriction uh, and then perform circumduction early. A lot of people are thinking that will help. Uh, isometrics early of the uh, quads, the glutes, and the transverse abdominis uh, can be done right away. And then active range of motion. Um, you know, that handout, if you guys are more <coughs> interested in this, goes over specific exercises in this phase that you can do. Um, it's just a picture of some basic circumduction exercises for the hip. Um, so criteria to get to phase two and out of this is you want to have minimal complaints with their phase one exercises. They should be able to do them appropriately. Um, muscles should be firing, they shouldn't be inhibited, and then they shouldn't get a lot of pinching pain. When you're flexing them up to about 100 degrees, that should be pretty comfortable before they go to the next phase. Full weight bearing should be allowed by the end of this phase. So most protocols, you're on crutches for three, four, and six weeks at the most, um, and so they should be able to put full weight on this before they go to the next phase. Phase two, controlled stability is usually about four or six weeks more. Um, they want to normalize the gait in this phase, uh, achieve independence with daily activities. There shouldn't be that much, uh, there shouldn't be that much discomfort in this phase. Uh, restore full range of motion should be done in phase two, and then improve just their neuromuscular control balance, proprioception, start doing functional exercises. Um, so getting there, you're weaning off the crutches with the weight bearing guidelines based on the procedure. Um, work on their gluteal, gluteal firing and core control non-resistant stationary bike, at least for the first six weeks. Full passive range of motion, maybe a little tight in external rotation. Uh, get in the, they can get in the pool aquatic program after the wounds are healed, and then um, avoiding treadmill. So criteria to get to phase three, they should have pain-free normalized gait, full range of motion, mild stiffness, maybe an external rotation, no joint inflammation, no muscular irritation or pain, 
and successfully initiated functional exercises. So as they get into phase three, this is usually four to eight weeks uh, in phase three. Goals are restoring muscular strength and endurance, optimizing neuromuscular control, balance, and proprioception, restoring cardiovascular endurance, which we can start earlier, and I'll talk about that in a few more slides. Is we can start that in phase one, but we really are ramping it up here in phase three. And then starting on sport progression is important. So depending on what the athlete does, starting some early uh, controlled things in their sport at phase three is useful. Um, so again, a lot of the physical therapy modalities are just continued in this. Uh, sports progressions, and then progressing cardiovascular fitness and advancing from double leg to single leg strengthening. Um, minimal criteria to get to phase four, they should be able to perform all these exercises in phase three pain free with correct form. And uh, there's a sport test that some people use to advance them on to the next sport and return to their sport. So return to sport phase another four to eight weeks. Uh, goals, you're restoring power, maximizing plyometrics, plyometrics um, returning to play. Uh, independent uh, in their maintenance program so they can do this on their own and they can understand how not to hurt their hip again. So if there are precautions, if there was a microfracture, you know, things to avoid further injury. Um, so developing a plan with their physical therapist and their physician for getting back to their sport is what's done in phase four, working on training conditioning. Um, and then basically to be done, they're just cleared by their physician and their therapist. Uh, they can go back to unrestricted uh, practice. So. I think uh, the surgery specific considerations for what do you do with a particular hip scope patient uh, or patient, you want to know what was done, communicating, you know, that should be communicated by us. If there's any question, call the surgeon and ask if there's any special precautions. Uh, I send all my patients with a specific protocol for what they had done, so it should be pretty clear. Um, and then, uh, so this will dictate your range of motion restrictions if there are any. Uh, Weight-bearing restrictions and how long, and then any special procedures, microfracture, or if they have a gluteus uh, tendon repair or something, you need to know about that. And this picture of what we do at the time of surgery is important, I think, for the physical therapist to understand, too. This is how we get in the joint. This is a capsulotomy. It's a very strong capsule in front of the hip. It's important in stability, and we cut right through it to get in there and see what we're doing. And depending on the patient, they may be repaired at the end of that as well. A lot of these patients are stiff to begin with. But for some of them, they have laxity, they have pincer impingement, they have other problems, and we repair the capsule at the end of the case. But you can see, you know, understanding that picture on the right and that capsulotomy that's performed makes sense for when we talk about what motions and things we want to avoid early on as that's healing. Um, so for, you know, a typical osteoplasty FAI patient, whether or not the labrum was repaired, um, we restrict hip extension past neutral for three weeks and that limits stress on the anterior capsule like I was just showing you. You want to avoid external rotation for three weeks and limit hip flexion past about 120. That's particularly with a labral repair. You don't want to be pinching on the repaired tissue that they just had fixed. Um, weight bearing, uh, most you know, protocols seem to be decreasing in the time that people are on crutches with hip arthroscopy. Foot flat or about 20 to 30 pound weight bearing for three weeks and then they're weaning off crutches for an additional week. Um, and then this may be extended. You may get an older patient or they have osteoporosis or they have a balance problem. You're worried they fall and are going to break their femoral neck. Uh, you, they may be on crutches a little longer. So with a tendon repair, if the gluteus medius and or minimus has been repaired, you want to avoid passive hip adduction, which makes sense, and avoid active hip abduction. And then weight bearing, this is similar to our shoulder patient with the rotator cuff, just like they're in the brace for six weeks. So we don't stress the repaired tendon. Same thing here, their foot flat weight bearing, which puts less stress on it than if they're non-weight bearing for six weeks. Uh, for microfracture procedures, that was our one patient from the beginning. Uh, if they've had a microfracture performed, uh, there's no additional range of motion limitations from what we said. And then uh, weight bearing is foot flat weight bearing for six to eight weeks. That's a long time. Uh, comes with its own morbidity and problems trying to keep people on crutches that long. They all say, well, I accidentally walked on it. So, you know, we do our best to keep people off it, to let the stem cells come out, for the, let the new cartilage form without causing problems. And then running is delayed for as long as possible, as long as it's not a running athlete. But uh, everything's delayed. We can use pool and aquatic rehab longer uh, in these patients, in the microfracture patients. Um, so cardiovascular fitness, this is really important. I think offering patients something they can do so they don't go crazy when they're rehabbing their hip is important. Um, so hip arthroscopy can be pretty challenging for these people. Long periods of inactivity are probably difficult mentally and physically. 
um, maintain fitness through um, exercise that are basically in line with the precautions we talked about. And there's, there's several opportunities to do that. Uh, this can be started after about the first week. So phase one, you know, that early phase in the first four or six weeks, what can patients do to work on their cardiovascular fitness? Uh, TRX type suspension training where they're not carrying around free weights and dumbbells and tripping over them and really protecting their hip. This is much safer. They can use their own body weight and gravity to work out. Uh, single well leg rowing um, is something that's offered and then swimming with a, a, a pole buoy um, for their legs after wounds have healed. So usually for my patients after two weeks they can get in the pool, use a pole buoy, buoy and, uh, and swim with their arms, which I think is really helpful. Uh, phase two, uh, you can keep the swimming up. Um, and then easy return to ice. We don't have a lot of skating sports here, but that can be done. And then resistance on the bicycle can start at week six. Um, phase three, as they're getting back their strength, um, you can get rid of the pull bu buoy on between their legs. They can swim normally. Return to progressions in the um, pool for non-microfracture patients so they can do running progressions starting in phase three. And then cycling and skating progressions. Phase four, um, just they're basically progressing back to their pre-surgery fitness programs. Uh, they're cleared basically for running, skating, swimming, cycling, and strengthening as tolerated. Again, microfractures, we would try to keep them off running uh, as long as we can. Um, so final thoughts, healing times, you'll see patients that will vary considerably within these phases. So it's, you know, our, athlete, our athletic patients tend to get better faster um, and more quickly than the average person, whether they have more reserves going in but, or they're more motivated or work out more, do their rehab more. They, tend to progress through these phases more quickly. Um, and they're most, the setbacks we'll see, and the setbacks you'll see is when you're trying to progress the patients from one phase to the next, is usually when someone will have a flare up or irritation of their hip. So just be aware of that. And then changing multiple variables at once when someone's switching from one phase to the next probably is what's causing that. So I think trying to limit how many things you're switching on the patient at once is probably important for the hips. So. So it's quick, kind of a quick talk about the hip stuff. Again, there's a lot more detail as far as the specific exercises that you can have your patients do. Um, so I'd encourage any and all of you to uh, read that article John, will, John can provide.